Hello and welcome to Bulimia Sucks because it does. My name is Kate Hudson Hall and thank you for listening. So you'll be listening to real stories from people who have suffered or are suffering an eating disorder. So this is a platform for people to share relatable and uplifting and inspiring conversations based on bulimia and anorexia. And episodes will include their personal stories of where they are now, their difficult journeys and their steps taken into recovering from their eating disorder. And our guest today is Alexandra. And she is 25 and in 2018, she was admitted to ERC in Denver for anorexia and binge purge time. She had an eating disorder for 12 years of her life. And at that point was A, hungry for recovery and literally hungry for recovery mm-hmm. and B, scared beyond belief. By the time she went to treatment, she had reached far beyond the point of thinking she could stop any more. So Alexandra, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you on on the show here. Yeah, this is amazing. This is so amazing that you're doing this. I'm I'm, I wish I'd been able to hear this a couple yeah. years ago. Uh, yeah, and it's really exciting because people so want to get involved and share their stories if they can help in any way because there's so many people out there, isn't there? That are... Yeah, and there's so much shame around it and so people feel afraid to come forth sometimes and, and really talk about it or even admit they have a problem. I remember when I was 16, I couldn't even say the word bulimia. I couldn't... Yeah say that word so yeah and look how far you've come I'm very grateful I'm very very grateful I thought I was going to die of this so I'm yeah. very grateful it's amazing so let's let's start off now let's start off with a funny story or a tale or a joke or a whatever you have for us <laughs> well my opening joke um that I always use at parties to try and see, is this going to be my crowd or not? Are these my sense of humor? I have a very childish sense of humor. I think in many ways, my eating disorder, I wanted to stay a child. It's almost like Peter Pan syndrome. I just wanted to stay young and small. And um, so this is my humor and I love this joke and it it helps me feel more comfortable at parties, but um, what kind of bees carry milk? I don't know what kind of bees carry milk. (laughs) Boobies. Oh. <laughs> it's silly. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's great. <laughs> well, we can all use that one. <laughs> yes, I know. It's tame. It's, I have many darker ones, but I never know if I'm allowed to <laughs> say those. So at least that's my innocent one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So, so Alex and Andres, so tell us about your the beginning of your journey with bulimia and anorexia. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, You know, I think in many ways it has to do with um, the society I grew up with in as well as just my family. Um, You know, I think if one or the other had been different, if I'd had maybe a distorted family uh, or disordered family, but the society wasn't disordered, maybe I would have been spared this pain. Or if I had a, a, a more healthy minded family and society would have been bad, maybe I would have been saved from this suffering. But I had both. I had a mom who grew up um, with two parents who both suffered from anorexia themselves. And then my both mom went parents. into- Both parents, wow. Both her parents were, they were, I would say almost orthorexic, which didn't exist at the time. They were such clean eaters that, I mean, my mom said she had rice and, and greens for like two years straight every dinner. It was only, we were only allowed certain things and everything was, there was always a rule. Um, fat people were shamed. There's a lot of fat phobia in her household. 
And so she grew up kind of thinking, oh, the less I eat, the better I am. And then she would go on these binges because biologically we're, we need to eat food. And um, so when I was 12 years old and I said, mom, I don't like my stomach. For some reason I knew, or I thought to hate my stomach. Um, I, I was, I grew up around the time of maybe Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears. And it was early 2000s of everyone wearing low cut jeans. I remember I just didn't have a flat stomach like these women did. And I thought, well, something therefore must be wrong with me. I didn't feel like anyone was celebrating having um, a little bit of a pouch. Everyone was saying, if, if you're thin, then you're lovable. At least that's what I was hearing. Yeah. And so and when I, I went a lot to of my, people feel that. Yeah. See these stars and the, you know, the beautiful figures and they've all been, um, yes. you know, cropped the, edited and and the, oh, they don't actually really look like that but then you don't think about that when you see the picture you think oh you know I'm never gonna look like that no and it's not talked about enough that that is all airbrushed and airbrushed like that's the word yeah. <laughs> I couldn't remember it, I, I actually remember being older a little bit older maybe 13 and I was walking by a poster and these boys said oh that's what a hot girl looks like and she was completely airbrushed something that I don't think my body is naturally ever going to look like. And I thought, well, seriously, something must be wrong with me because I don't look like that. And then when I went to my mom at the age of 12 and I said, mom, I don't like my stomach. She said, honey, then don't eat bread. Like that was her solution. It wasn't you're beautiful the way you are. You're perfect the way you are. Your mind is crazy. Your society is crazy. It was like, oh, honey, then food is the problem. And it was like, ding, ding, ding. Um, now I know what I need to do. And um so way before I had bulimia, way before I developed true, a true eating disorder, diet culture mentality had already been planting its seeds. And these seeds were able to grow because of the environment I grew up in and the society I grew up in and then the mind that I have. I just have a, I'm powerful. I think people with eating disorders are so powerful and we're so afraid of that power that we, we use it almost we use our eating disorders almost to never have to really take risks or fear because eating disorder keeps us small, you know? Um, and I don't only mean like the body. I think one can have an eating disorder no matter what the body looks like. I just mean it keeps us, our world small. Um, and I somehow convinced my parents when I was 15 years old that it would be a good idea to go to fat camp. And I was not. So, so tell me, so from the age of 12 to 15 then, mm -hmm. so had the anorexia and bulimia sort of taken hold or? So I would say what had taken hold was restriction first. I, I wouldn't have called it anorexia or, or bulimia yet, but I was always on some sort of diet and then going, and then going off it and binging on the weekends. Um, and I wanted, I, I wanted to learn how to have an eating disorder. Like I, that was a desire of mine. I wanted to, no matter what the cost, I wanted to be thin. I would go away in the summers and think this summer, this is going to be the summer that I'm going to get that body. And then I'm going to be lovable and I'm going to be loved and everything's going to be awesome. And it was always came back to body. If my body was just small enough, then I would be lovable. If my body was just small enough, then I feel confident and I feel beautiful. Um, that's how every, that's, you know such a wide variety yeah. type person that's how they think you know yes you know even yes. with figures There's of a lot diet, people will yeah. be thinking that let alone having a you know a full-blown eating disorder I no I I agree I think there's a lot more disordered eating that goes undetected because it's it's valid in this society to have disordered eating it's you're validated for under eating and you're shamed for eating. Yeah. And so it, it goes undetected a lot of times. Um, and I know plenty of women in my life who still are able to diet. And I just believe it's kind of living like a half life. If you're able to, to diet, you're kind of just never, and I'm lucky. I think that I've had an eating disorder because it meant I had to learn how to undiet, how to live freely yeah. in this body, this earth shell. I had to learn how to be allowed to eat, give myself permission in life it was a huge thing. Yeah. Um, and I went away when I was 15, it was I think only two weeks. And it was like, 
everything, all the seeds that have been planted, this was like fertilizer. This was like, I'm gonna make it grow real fast. I went to some low life pack camp in LA at the time. And I actually was, it was the summer before I went to England. And so you add these roots that had been- So why did you go to the, why did you go to the pack camp then? Because I believed that I was needing to learn how to eat right. I thought I ate wrong. Right. And I just, I just had, my problem is food, I always thought. And if I just learned how to eat right, then I'll, then I'll be thin. It was always that, then I'll be thin, then I'll be okay, then I'll be okay. I was just never okay in the body I was in. I was never okay in the moment. Um, and it was then, it was that year um, that I would, got diagnosed with anorexia and then fell into bulimia because I'm a perfectionist and I don't, I don't do not, uh, getting your approval well. So what happened was, is I got really thin and I was told, oh, you're too thin. You need to eat more. And so I would eat and then throw it up because. Yeah. Then everybody would think, yeah, okay, she's eating. Everyone was happy with me because yeah. I was eating and believe me, I didn't know this, but it, it made me gain weight at the time actually. And I felt like I had, I, I knew it was bad. But I also felt like, oh, this is just what I have to do because everyone else, get, I guess, gets it for free. They get their nice bodies for free and I just have to yeah. work at it. Yeah, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So everybody else seems to have it, but I haven't got those tools or whatever they may be. Oh, it was, it was, a. am so sad for that 16 year old girl who felt like her body was so wrong that she had to eat and throw up. Or, or starve herself in order to be lovable like that's so sad and I'm and the amount of love I have for that that girl that 16 year old self of mine now um, and the love I can have for people who suffer with this I mean it, it's it's brutal it's it's so brutal because I always thought well if I was only you know a drug addict I just have to stop using drugs, yeah. but I have to eat. I remember thinking that, and I'm sure that most of us have had that thought. It's like, you know, this, you know, if I was an alcoholic and, hey, look, mm -hmm. I can just stop drinking alcohol. That, that you know, let's just yeah. stop eating. But exactly. no, <laughs> it's not going to work. No, no, I was, I was, it's not, it's, it's, we don't need alcohol to function. We need food. Food is good. Food is life. Food is food is amazing and and I think giving ourselves permission to eat that's what healed my eating disorder in the end but um what 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 do you mean um well I never had I, permission I always thought that um if I ate and if I ate too much then that was a bad thing and if I ate the wrong foods then it was a bad thing and I was a calorie counter and I was um an over exerciser and it, you know my bulimia started off with was I was just too full that wasn't okay that was not acceptable to me I was there was no permission there was no you're allowed to be human I was like you have to be superhuman you have to feel empty you have to be thin and if bulimia is what it takes to get there then that bulimia is what we'll do um and that's a, it's it was a very fast downhill uh drive and I actually I, I recovered from bulimia that time around and I went back into it um, in my early 20s how again did you recover the first time no oh, it was barely recovery it was just um I couldn't I couldn't do it anymore I was I my body I didn't feel like I was still trying to restrict and diet all the time I always wanted to get back to a thin body if I'm just thin if I'm just thin so there was no recovery in terms of it was never going to last but I just wasn't throwing up. I thought, okay, well, that's not working. Like it's not even making me thin. I, my throat hurts. Um, I, I, I can't stop once I start. So um, I went a couple years without throwing up and I was drinking a lot at the time. I was just replacing my need to not feel my feelings. Yeah, to touch yourself. Yeah. How and, old were you at this age? This is, I was about 18, right. I would say. I was just leaving, just finishing my A-levels in England. And 
unfortunately, you know, you get praised for losing weight and for being thin. Yeah. I got a lot of attention when I was thin and lo- and I equated it attention with love. And so I felt when that attention left, that love had left. And so I was worthless at any other size other than my anorexic size. Um, because one gets praised for being on a diet, one gets praised for being small, like, oh my God, you've lost so much weight. That's a compliment in our society. And yet gaining weight is considered a bad thing. You're lazy. You're, you don't, take care of yourself you're not healthy there's this terrible lie that health and weight are equal yeah and that's just not the case um but i one doesn't learn that in school you know Uh, and if you don't have parents and if you have a sick society then where do you get those tools yeah and i think that's a a good point yeah you know those those should be talked about more in schools i know they are starting to you know, to introduce it, bring it in and talk about it in more detail, but it's still not enough, I don't think. No, and when I, when I, I had, I went to school in Zurich for a bit and then in London, and when I, I remember each one of those schools did have someone with an eating disorder come and talk, but I was so far removed from knowing what my, that what I had was an eating disorder. I didn't, I just knew I wanted to be thin. I couldn't identify with them because what they had seemed like more intense I'm not that bad right it's like I'm not that bad it's such a thing of eating disorder people I'm not bad enough I'm not sick enough to recover let me get sicker yeah yeah see how far I can go with this Mm -hmm. yeah and and it's a lot of the permission again I'm not deserving of recovery I'm not deserving because I'm not sick enough or whatever it was um Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I was, I was 18 when I was trying to not be bulimic, but I was still chronically dieting and, and starving myself and going on binges. And um, I, I got into a relationship when I was 21 years old. And in hindsight, it was never a good relationship, but at the time I was head over heels. And when he left, I thought it's because my body was not the way it should be Um, quote unquote um, should be I thought if I'm just small enough if I just get small enough and uh, there again that anorexia came in it was that dedication to to taking up less space because I thought that would be what would win him back and and it didn't win him back but it got me right back into the depths of a bulimia that I wish upon wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy um I wish upon no one to be bulimic it's brutal it's really terrible what we put ourselves through. Yeah. Um, so then it came on full force, I suppose, with all those emotions and distress. Yeah. And it was so, it's so like, it's so tricky because it knows exactly how to get you. It started off when I wrote, when I was broken up with, it started off with me just two weeks of, I was so emotional that I, I couldn't eat. I physically couldn't bring myself to eat. And it was almost as if I was like, oh yeah, that, I want to keep that feeling of not eating. And so it was, it was, I called it intuitive eating at first. Like I was just eating whenever I wanted to. Right. And so I've, I've actually used intuitive eating as a diet. That's why I don't tend to, now I know that I'm an intuitive eater, but I couldn't get to freedom through the word intuitive eating because I thought, oh, am I hungry now? Am I allowed to eat? Is this hunger? I don't know. Is this hunger? Am I hungry? Maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not hungry. I'm probably not hungry. And it was like, it became a diet. I had to know exact, it was like any rule and I'm taking it into a, an eating disorder. Um, and so I, um, I remember <clears throat> I had lost some weight again. I had gotten that praise again and I binged. And I'm going, why did I binge? I thought I'm doing this right. I'm finally eating whatever I want. And the truth was, I wasn't. I was trying to eat as little as possible. There's right. a book out there called The Fuck It Diet, which actually ended up saving my life after treatment too. And yeah, um, or they went together in tandem. And um, she talks about that she went on the French diet. You know, French women all they, all they eat is a is a croissant in the morning and a cigarette for lunch, and like that's not healthy. <laughs> that's not recovered. <laughs> that's sick too but it's sexy in our culture, right? It's like, so um, 
yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, unlearning to be done. I had a lot of food rules that I didn't even know were food rules. Like I told myself, don't eat past 6 p.m. or whatever. That's so, so stupid. Like my, mm. my body knows now when to eat. But at the time I thought, just learn the rules. Then, um, then I'll be okay. And um, so, yeah, so I was driving home one day and I, I had binged and I really, I said to myself, this is not okay. You're not allowed to binge. And I, I attempted to purge again after years of not doing it. And it was a rapid decline, you know, within, within a year and a half, I was in treatment. I went to treatment. So this was when you were 21 after this boy. Yes, this, this boy is when I was 21. And I went to treatment when I was 23. So it was very quick decline. And by the time I had gone to treatment and I have more stories I have to, I happily share, but by the time I had gone to treatment, um, I had sold my, my body for sex, uh, for, for money so that I could afford my bulimia habit. I mean, it was, it sounds like a drug addict, but it was for, so that I could buy more bags of groceries. I had, um, I had, my parents had said, you either go to treatment, which will pay for, or you're homeless. And I had decided to become homeless. I made the decision that my staying thin through Bumia or more important than anything else in the world. And I didn't realize until I finally said yes to treatment that I had been hopeless. I found some hope again. I just thought this is how I'm going to die. And it wasn't even that bleak. It was just like, this is what I have to do. And if I die, then I die. Um, any other life seemed unfathomable. It seemed I was disgusted by any other version of myself, even though really what I was doing with my head in the toilet or laxatives all the time or not eating, that's what was, that's the, that's the life that I don't, I don't ever want to go back to. Um, but at the time it seemed like the only normal one. So you um, chose to go and live home as a homeless person rather than going to treatment. Yeah. I did. I chose to be homeless rather than going to treatment. That was my choice. And how long did you live like that? I really didn't. <laughs> I I made the decision to go to treatment. I mean, it would, my, my I was fully willing to be homeless. And I don't know if it was God or the universe or just something in me that still wanted to live. Um but right before I was about to be homeless, um, I said, okay, I'll go to treatment. And that was one of the scariest surrenders I've ever had to come to because I was so certain that they were taking away something that I needed. Like an eating disorder that, feels like- an That's what's so scary about it. This, this is how you know how you can cope is through the eating disorder and having the being, yes. being being able to deal with your emotions by you know throwing up or yes not eating so it's so scary and it, it just you know it doesn't seem possible when you're engulfed in it does it yes exactly no it doesn't seem possible it seemed um like my world was coming to an end like I everything I had known I felt like I might as well resign myself to just you know not, there's nothing wrong with this but in my head I was like well they're just gonna fatten me up like a pig I'm gonna be 400 pounds I'm gonna move to India and slowly kill myself that way I mean it felt like this the extremes of either having to be tiny or the, then the worst thing in the world was the opposite of that is it's really sad because that those are ideals and 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 um thoughts that were put into my head, not by my own, you know, that, that comes with, with living surrounded by a society that is that distorted, I think. And, and um, I would say that if it's not natural to have an eating disorder, that's not natural, right? It's not natural to want to starve ourselves. And then the body wants to keep us safe and alive. And so it gets hungrier and it slows down our metabolism. And it does all these things that unbeknownst to us is actually going against like um, all the things we wanted. It's, it's like, we can't actually keep ourselves that small. It's not what's intended. And it's, our body doesn't know that society says small is better. 
And it, it's going, no, this, if your body is, is needing to eat, then you need to eat. And I didn't realize that. Um, so um, yeah, I went to, I was willing to go to treatment um, after a lot of pain, doing a lot of terrible things to myself. Um, bulimia, it was like, it was like, I felt like I've never taken heroin in my life, but it felt like heroin. I felt like I was getting the shakes and uh, if I didn't have my needle of heroin of bulimia, then I, I, and I remember one night I was in my bed and I was going, please don't do it, please. Like, I didn't want this anymore. The, 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 and that's the what's so left confusing, this. isn't it? Because there's that part of you that doesn't want to do it at all. And then that part of you that like gets hold of you and you just have no choice. Yeah, I've talked about it a lot actually as, and I think they, there's almost science behind it or at least most people I talk to, it feels like there's two of you. There's two entities living inside of you. And one is the eating disorder one. And I used to call her Persephone because it's the goddess of the underworld. And I felt like she was pulling me under, like just, I'm gonna get you, I got you. And there was me and my voice became smaller and smaller the more I engaged in my bulimic behavior. And bulimic behavior to me is not only throwing up, you know, it's, it's for me, it's also dieting, it's not eating enough, it's, it's over exercising, it's whatever it is to try and yeah. purge myself of food, yeah. whether that's not eating it at all or, or actually throwing up. Yeah. Um, but the more I gave in to Persephone, the bigger she got, the stronger she got. And the, her voice was really big and her voice controlled me. And my little tiny voice of recovery of true Alexandra, who I am in my core, was tiny yeah. and didn't feel like she could, she could be heard. Um, she was so much weaker. Yeah. And I was in bed. I, and I, was I, shaking. I imagined like um, a little green leprechaun, <laughs> like yeah. this evil little beast that would sit on my shoulder and like whisper in my ear all of the wicked you know wickedness yeah <laughs> and then exactly. recovery, I'd like bat him off yeah uh, the more I've been in recovery I'm like where th that voice maybe it's really far quiet somewhere but it's gone like I know some people say that you're always going to have the yeah. thoughts or the voices or it's gone sort of it's yeah. gone and yeah. I and I I have to tell people that because on, when I'm on groups sometimes on these eating disorder groups and someone's like, will it ever go away? And some people are like, no, it doesn't, but it gets better. And I'm like, that's just not true. Yeah. You can be a hundred percent free of your eating disorder. I I don't believe you're born with an eating disorder. I believe it's something that's it's learned. That you've learned. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And so one can be a hundred percent free. It's definitely so that's nice. But at the time, she was Persephone was much stronger. My eating disorder. Some people call it Ed you know, yeah. ED, eating disorder, ED. Um, and I remember there was one night where I was, I had was shaking. I was going, please don't, please, 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 please don't. And my legs just like out of the bed without my control. And I was down the stairs without my control. And I was in the fridge without my control. And I was going, please stop out loud. And I couldn't, I could not stop. And, and for me, the only thing that stopped it was going to a facility where I was unable to do the behavior. And I was hungry. I mean, like you opened it up for me. I was, I was hungry. I was hungry for recovery and I didn't even know it. Um, and so I followed what they suggested and I did what they suggested. And I had a lot more learning to do outside of recovery. Yeah. But something that really, really helped me, I ate every meal they gave me. I never had to drink. There was a special drink you had to drink if you didn't eat your meal. And if you didn't do that, you got a feeding tube. And there was one time, I think it was close to the end. I had maybe, I was there for maybe another two weeks or something. How long were you there in total? I was there for two months. Yeah. And the problem is, it's, you know, insurance based. So insurance covered it. And when insurance is involved, once I got weight restored, they were kind of like, you're done. But I was not mentally restored yet. Yeah. yeah. So I was weight restored. And um, I actually, I was very, I got very, positive about recovery um, I was very excited about recovery after treatment but I still had a lot of learning to do because I, I wasn't health at every size oriented yet which um, is a new movement or maybe it's not new it's founded I think in the 80s or 90s a book came out called health at every size um, so I had a lot more learning to do but in treatment there was one time where um, I, I thought I was intuitively eating and so they had given me my meal and I didn't finish it. I said, I'm full, I'm done. 
And they said, well, then you have to drink Boost, which was the drink they used. And I said, I'm not going to drink that either. I'm full. I'm done. I know my body now, is what I said. And that was the first night in the two months that I'd been there, or the maybe month and a half at that point that I'd been there, that I wanted to binge. And it was so illuminating because I saw that I didn't even know I was restricting. I just didn't eat enough food and I wanted to overeat. I wanted to binge that night so badly. And it was so eye-opening. And I'm so grateful I didn't binge. Yeah. And I'm so grateful I did that though too, because I saw it was the first example of like, oh, when I don't eat, my body overcompensates. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Um, that has helped me be willing to allow food because I know my problem isn't food. My problem isn't that I'm an overeater, that I'm a that I'm addicted to food, that I'm a binger. My problem is not binge eating disorder. That's why I throw up, any of that. My problem is that I had a restriction mentality from the gate. I was told, I believe food is my problem. My weight is my problem. If I just don't eat, or if I eat less, or if I learn how to eat right, or in LA, it's a lot about eating clean, you know, that orthorexic type of eating disorder, um, then I'll be okay. And the truth is, no, that's exactly what put me into a um, starvation mentality and also food scarcity mentality. If I don't, if my body doesn't believe food is coming, it slows down my metabolism. It makes me extra hungry <laughs> and I have no control over that it's biology. There was a, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard this. There was a, a, a project done in Minnesota in the 1940s and yeah, yeah, yeah. this is so, was so revealing to me because you know we spoke about being a drug addict or an alcoholic like not everyone's a drug addict or an alcoholic some people can drink normally everyone who restricts will develop eating disorder tendencies or yeah. will develop some sort of eating disorder it's just human it's just because it's not the same as as having um an alcohol problem it's it is very different in eating disorder and um in the minnesota project for the listeners who don't know um, these researchers tried to find a way. So it was have, a long time ago, wasn't it? It was in the 50, 40s, 50s, something like that. It was either the 40s or 50s. Yeah. It was as a. Because you wouldn't be allowed trying, to do it today. <laughs> no, you would never be allowed to do that today. But they were trying to find out how to refeed their men after they came back from war because they, a lot of them had not eaten enough. And so what they did is they fed these men. This is, by the way, called, this was called a semi-starvation diet. They fed them 1,600 calories. That was a semi-starvation diet. When you think about it, and we have the 2,000 recommended calorie allowance, that's terrible because yeah. 2,000 calories is not enough for anybody. Yeah. It's enough for a child, but that's about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they fed, they starved these men, and these men developed. So these men did it by choice, didn't they? It was their choice whether they did it or not. Yeah, they were, they were, um, conscientious objectors I think is what they called they didn't want to fight in the war so they had to do other things and they signed up um they signed up for this experiment having no prior eating disorders no prior history of uh, um food and body dysmorphia of any kind and slowly they were starved um and all of them all of them started to like sneak food and go out and try to find more food and became obsessed with food. And some of them wanted to be chefs afterwards. I mean, food became the focal point. It was all about food and um, That's all body image. About. Oh, and they, they also had total body dysmorphia. Like they, yeah. they started to think that what they were, what they looked like was normal and everyone else was just larger, and too large in their opinion. Um, and what the researchers found is, you know, re in the refeeding process, it, it didn't suffice to just feed them a small amount of food. They had to be refed by like two or three times the amount of food that they'd been eating. Um, and so that just was super eye-opening that like, it's, it's not a poor character. I'm not broken that I have an eating disorder. This is biology. This is- yeah. I think that's a really I'm, good point. Yeah. yeah. We're not born with this. No. no. With these are bodies that are you picked up from experiences from wherever you know it, it, you know the yeah. power of suggestion as you know and it exactly. takes somebody to say one thing to you 
So when yeah. the reason I developed an eating disorder, I had started to be aware of my weight and I was concerned that I was overweight, but I wasn't overweight at all. And mm -hmm. this friend came around for dinner and she said to me, oh, and we were just at dinner and we were talking about our weight, our weight problem that we didn't have. <laughs> and she yeah. said to me, oh, so did you know if you eat a Mars bar and then you make yourself sick, you won't put the weight on? That's a fantastic idea. And so I yeah. ran with it. Yeah. Oh, I was very good at it. <laughs> yeah. It's like cheating. It's like you get to eat your cake and have it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was, I, that's exactly the same thought I had. It was like, oh, wow, I found the key. I didn't realize that it was, you know, slowly becoming an absolute, or maybe not slowly, but it became an absolute mental obsession to binge and purge. It was like, um, like every night I would develop this, this anxiety, but if I didn't quench that thirst for anxiety, it felt like I was going to, I mean, it's not to be dramatic, but it really felt like something was going to die. Like I just yeah. so anxious and I would go down to the grocery store and I would buy like food for a family of four. And then I would just place it around me. I mean, at this point, like my anxiety is already starting to settle. It's like my, my, my Persephone, my attic knows that that, 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 um, hit of heroin is coming it's all it's all gonna be okay she's gonna binge and purge she's got me this is insane yeah it's so insane it doesn't and make any insidious. sense it doesn't make any sense but it's just yeah. it's just something that becomes so uncontrollable that you can't stop it yeah and that was part of the sad part for me is I had you know you have these like are they called ultimatums like if, if I do this then I'll stop or, or I, I promise I'll never do this thing mm -hmm. and I did all those things every single thing I said I wasn't going to do I did I worked in a preschool at the time I was throwing up in the bathroom of a preschool yeah. um, my cousin who is now 14 you know has grown up around very very unhealthy parents and in a very unhealthy environment and she said at the age of five don't give me bread and she has I mean I don't know. She has a, maybe a long way to go with her recovery, but I threw up in front of her. I threw up in front of my brother. Um, I, I, I traveled and threw up there. I thought, you know, maybe if I get out of my environment, I won't throw up. I mean, I always had these benchmarks of like, if I, I'm not going to do that. Or if I do that, then I will stop. And I, my bulimia was in charge. I was not in charge anymore. And I think I, I, I maybe wrote this in the email to you, but I used to call it a car. That my, my life with bulimia is like driving in a car mm. that I think I have the brakes to and the brakes don't work. Not only that, but every time something terrible happens that I don't want to feel, I just throw it in the back. I go, oh, I'll deal with that later. I don't, and now that I want to stop my car and I'm going full speed ahead and the brakes don't work, I'm going, frick, the brakes don't work. And my second thought is, but if they do work, what then I'll have to look at all the stuff I've been throwing back then my car will slam to a halt and I'll see all the stuff that I haven't been wanting to look at so recovery recovery is it's like going it, it's it's looking at that stuff and it's going against at that point what feels like nature and so it's it's hard there's a wonderful quote by a registered dietitian that I follow on Instagram whose name I'm forgetting right now and she says we're eating disorder recovery is a million tough choices on top of a million more to the next hard thing you are worth the effort. It's like, it's a million decisions going, I'm not gonna listen to you anymore at eating disorder. I'm not going to listen to you more anymore, Persephone. Um, and turning that car around or, or finding brakes is, yeah. I couldn't do it without outside help. So you spent, so did you say two months in the clinic? Yeah. Yeah. And then, then what did you do after that? Um, after I got out, I was really, really scared because it, it was scary to let go of, you know, a best friend almost, my only friend at that point, pretty much. Um, and then it was scarier to like re-enter the world in a different, um, different body. And I was really scared of rejection and of, of you know, that... That thing that sometimes people say oh you look healthy and I, oh, hate that. Yes. I hate that and I I try to now get the emphasis off of complimenting people about anything that they look like 
You know, why is it always about the external? Why can't we compliment? Oh, I love the way you said hi to me today. You seem so happy today. Like that's, those are such better compliments than yeah. I love your dress, which is better than I, you've lost weight, but it's still exterior oriented. And I think when we think, when we equate the exterior and love, like if I look pretty, then I get love. That's where a lot of yeah. disorder can, yeah. has room to grow. Yeah. I was so really scared. Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. So, so, so tell me, so then after that, so how did you, did you find a therapist externally then? Yeah, so they helped. So I had been in therapy. Um, one of my favorite people growing up was my grandmother. And she always had an eating disorder too. So it was just, I was eating almonds and complaining about her non-existent belly. I mean, she was tiny, but she was, and she died when I was 13 of, of ovarian cancer. She actually died um, because she, she couldn't eat anymore. They had cut out most of her colon and she couldn't keep food down anymore. So they, she, was not, she was not eating for two weeks. That's how she died. And it's just so, it's so tragic too, because she said on her deathbed, I wish I had just allowed myself that extra piece of chocolate cake. I, I can't even imagine, you know, being 70 years old, she had gone through world wars, um, terrible atrocities and then thinking that the answer to that would be to be small mm -hmm. to take up less space in the world and then she died saying i wish i'd eaten that extra piece of chocolate cake i mean and what can we i all, want future what generations can we, what can we all learn from that i i want future generations to not have that same mentality that i'm not allowed chocolate cake what i learned from that in that moment was um or I, I couldn't hear it until de like a decade later when I was 23 and going to treatment. But what I, what I hear now is someone who at the end of her life realized that, that it wasn't worth it. Not allowing herself that extra piece was not worth it. It didn't bring her anything but misery in the end. It's not, life is too short to have an eating disorder. It's just too but short. We can learn from her. I mean, that's huge, isn't so it? So much. Yeah. yeah. She, she was obviously looking back at her life and thinking, you know, this just, I've done it wrong. Mm -hmm. And I should mm -hmm. have eaten more. Mm -hmm. I, I should have addressed yeah. what happened, you know, how I dealt yeah. with everything, I suppose. And I'm so grateful that I got to heal. I mean, there's generational trauma, eating disorders. My, my mom didn't heal her eating disorder. I healed it and now she got to look at it and heal it more. She still has a lot of, uh, when you've been ingrained to have fat phobia and to think that health and weight are, they are equal, that's still, that's, I can understand how that could be very hard to unlearn. Um, and I, part of my motivation to, to get recovered and to stay recovered was I remember I was looking this little girl was looking up at me, never met her before in my life. It was maybe two seconds long. And I remember being that little girl and looking up at women and going, oh, I just want her body. And she was looking up at me and I was severely bulimic. I was very underweight. I was very unhealthy. And she couldn't see any of that. There was no sign I'm here going, don't do this. This is unhealthy. I never saw anyone's sign going like, I'm doing this by restricting or I'm doing this by purging. All I saw was, beautiful quote unquote beautiful bodies that I wanted and I thought I never want to live that lie again I never want to live that lie for that little girl again because I was that little girl and I wish someone had just told me the lie they just filled me in the hey this by the way this isn't natural yeah yeah but just being told that yeah yeah and um so when so, I left treatment I was yeah so because we're kind of running out of time so you left treatment and then and then what? I left treatment and then I uh, um I had a year of of um I met a boy in a residential treatment and it was nice to have someone who actually understood eating disorders um in my life like that who could love me while he was suffering too and we actually ended up splitting ways because he didn't want to recover and I really wanted to recover and um but that was that was helpful for me I actually um, a year later, almost exactly a year later, I was struggling again and I had relapsed. I threw up maybe a few times. Um, and I didn't want to go back to the gates of hell, as I used to call it, like of my true bottom of eating disorder and bulimia. 
And I tried um, a 12 step program and I really disagree with the 12 step program for at least the one here for OA, they teach how to eat right. And if you stay in a certain weight range, then you're okay. And so I actually ended up, up getting sicker in a 12 step program. And then I read this book I mentioned before called The Fuck It Diet. Mm-hmm. My world was opened. I was binging again at this point because I'd been restricting a bit for that year. And that's why I, I, I threw up. It was, um, again, just thinking I'm, I'm doing it right. Thinking I'm intuitively eating, right? But you know, not eating till three is not okay. <laughs> It's, yeah. that's not intuitive eating that's restriction yeah. um, and I didn't realize that and no one pulled my covers because society tells you it's okay to not eat um and so I I, I my therapist who I adore she's an eating disorder specialist therapist um is amazing but even she was telling me like oh throw away all the food in your house or I read online like oh brush your teeth after dinner it's not binge I mean terrible terrible thing yeah. And um, finally, this book by Caroline Dooner, I think is how you pronounce her name. She said, allow it. She's like, eat. She's like, that's the answer. And I was, t- I was like, this, this can't be it. Like I've been told my whole life, don't eat or eat right. This can't be it. And so I allowed it and I allowed it. And I would say for six months, I was binging and, and eating a lot, but I was giving myself permission. I was just saying, you know what? If I'm hungry, I'm going to eat no matter what. Yeah. And when in doubt, I will eat no matter what. And what happened was, is that um, the food scarcity mentality was set free. I believe, I believe now food is always going to be there. Um, eventually, that and hunger. Really that now. Exactly. And that hunger, my, my metabolism was like, woo, kicked up. I mean, I was, I could, I would always eat it. And if I would eat at night or like binge at night and not throw it up, I would wake up and just feel terrible. And at this point, because I was eating at night all the time. I got hungry in the morning. It was like the craziest thing to me. I was like, wow, my body's actually hungry or I can be full and that's okay. And it, and it passes. And then I get hungry again. Like my body knows what to do. Um, so the solution for me was just to eat, 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 eat. Food is good. Food is, food is amazing. Food is life. Food is necessary. And, um, bulimia was not the option. I was never, even if I was, you know, I, I, I eat like a bulimic. I don't just eat it. Like I, I was binging to purge my body still thought I need to binge because she's going to purge so I was eating so much food I was in so much pain and and all the voices all the voices that everyone has of like oh but but your health and this can't be good and and I just ignored them I said Persephone you don't get to win anymore and um now it's 2021 and I did that in September of 2019 and I've been living um a life that I didn't know it was possible I think as of the age of eight I just decided my body was wrong and today I'm like so free so um relaxed around food it's wow. it's, it's like I can't even believe it like it, I, I know this is possible I can eat when I want um, sure. So, Alexandra, so what do you think specifically was the turning point? So do you think it was giving yourself permission to eat and allowing yourself to eat and battering yes. away those thoughts? I would say um, the turning point, and I was that book, The Fuck It Diet. I do have a friend, though, right now who was trying to recover from her bulimia by purely reading the fuck it diet. And I told her, I said, honey, I think you're too far gone. I think you need to go to treatment. Yeah. And I do think for certain people, the yeah. only thing that can help is some sort of treatment facility. Um, because I do think one needs to be refed before one can really sometimes see things. And it's really hard to break that bulim- the bulimia cycle because it's so addictive in a way. Like it's so mm, powerful sometimes. I think um, to me- so- when I had it, because it was such a long time ago and there wasn't any treatment centers and there was nowhere to go really. And I remember thinking, I just don't know how to eat. And there, was, there wasn't really any books out there because it was in the 80s. And, yeah, yeah. and I remember the Eating Disorders Association over in the UK. I, um, I signed up for their course. And, they, mm. and so they, we would do it on the telephone once a week and I would speak to and it went on for about six or eight weeks. And I would speak to the counsellor once a week. And in the meantime, they'd sent me a booklet to fill out weekly. And then I would send it back to them 
all through the post and on the telephone. <laughs> but I remember receiving the details of the foods that they expected me to eat, shocked. But it was such a revelation because it gave me a guideline because I had no idea how to eat right. and what to eat and what, right. what I should eat. Should eat. Mm -hmm. It was such yeah. an eye opener. Yeah. And that's been helpful now too, you know, now living in recovery. First, first and foremost, I say eat like a lot. Of, have your body know that there's permission and that if food is plentiful and it will always come and, and that it's not going to happen again. We're not going to restrict again, honey. Like I have to really talk to myself very kindly. And then I was able to look at how I, I might use food as a tool and that's okay. I want food as a tool in my toolbox, but I want, I need more tools in life. Food was my only tool at one point. And so I've, I've expanded my toolbox. I have friends and a fellowship of, of people who are in recovery and that's a tool that people I can lean on. I have, you know, bath time is a tool sometimes just like taking a moment for oneself to be kind. I make sure to have tea every night with milk and honey. Um, soothers, like I need, I need to learn how to self-soothe properly because food and having eating disorder was like a soother. It was a distraction from having to live life. And yeah. I mean, I can finish with this story. It was, this is what reminds me of how I stay in recovery is there's a, a science experiment done. I'm going to butcher it. So if people who are listening know it better than I'm sorry, but there's a science experiment done, um, a rat in one cage and a rat in another. And the rat in the first cage had water, food and water laced with heroin and no full life. It was just a cage, just a rat in a cage. And then the other rat in the second cage had the same water, food, and water laced with heroin. But this rat's life was big and it had a whole castle to explore and it could visit with other friends and it never touched the heroin because it had this big life. It didn't feel in this. So it had the more book. space. It had more space, but it also had, it just had a full rat life, like a big, like tons of other things going on, a lot of love, maybe more love. And the rat that had nothing, that had no full life, died of a heroin overdose. Right. And to me, it was like when my life is small, when I'm not being kind to myself, and then the eating disorder seems enticing. Yeah. It's it's a it's a purpose. It's control. It's a friend. You know, it's it's secure because it's not going to leave. It, it's like it can stick on me like glue. And um, contrastingly, when my life is full and I have a lot of friends and I'm and I'm being kind to myself and kind to others and finding other things that give me joy and purpose eating disorders like not even not even a thought don't want that at all so what can people learn from that I would say that you know it's one thing to just you know surrender the eating disorder but one has to replace it with love in one's life I feel like a lot of times it was like it was like the secure love or parent or something and so replacing that with true love because an eating disorder is not love. It's obsession, it's self-harm, it's torture yeah. um, that presents itself in something that one can control. Um, and I mean, I, I get it. Like I, there used to be fear of foods. But all, none of that is there anymore. And it's because I made my life bigger. And I, I was willing to take the, I was willing to grow up. It was really scary, really scary. Um, but it's actually much better now on the other, other side of things. And I, I walk women through the fuck a die book weekly, um, men too, actually men go too. And, um, so where can I, people I can find empathize. you? Um, people can find me, um, on my, I have a, a few Instagram accounts. Um, and also, um, I'm just trying to think what's the best way. Yeah, probably Instagram. Um, I have two accounts. One is a private one. That's the body recovery one. And um, the other one is my personal one, but I'm, but it's an open account and I'm very authentic there too. Um, and I can put, I can give you those names. Yeah, we can put them at the end of the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I'm always, all are welcome to these, to these recovery groups. Um, it's all done on, on, on Zoom with zero camera, because I just think different people yeah. are at different times in their recovery and it doesn't always feel good to see someone else in, yeah. in the pr 
process. So um, yeah, it's very gentle, very loving. And we, we read the Fuck It Diet book by Caroline Duner and we emphasize, you know, food is good and health can be found at every size and um, that you're allowed to take up space and recovery is possible and all these wonderful things that I know I needed to hear early on too. That's fabulous. And how many people do you have joining? Right now it's anywhere from like five to 10 people. Um, it's, it's newer and I, I hadn't really, I'm slowly started to open it up, but it was starting off with just some friends who came to me in quarantine and were like, I, I can't stop throwing up or I, I'm really yeah. upset with my body or whatever. And I was like, why don't we just start this group? And um, I'm, I'm excited to see how it expands and where it can go. And yeah. I'm such a recovery advocate. So I'm always happy to talk to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. It's just so important. I think particularly now, after all we've been through with lockdowns, this, yeah. it, you know, it must have been so hard for people. And then the, the, um, what's coming out now and the research particularly I don't know in the UK they're talking about how people and the statistics are showing how people are, have developed recently this last year an eating disorder they didn't already have it before because of lockdown yeah, yeah I believe it you know it's, it's a disease or it's a, a disorder and a malady that um, loves us to be isolated so give us a lockdown and it's like I got her I got him yeah. and um yeah that's yeah. really sad and i hope those people can can recover and i know they can recover i hope they choose recovery because um i also have a lot of friends who didn't um make it because it is a life and death yeah. thing this is very it's very serious yeah yeah so alexandra so thank you so much for joining us today and sharing the the journey that you've been through and and then, you know, there's so much that people can learn from hearing what you've had to say. And I just love the yeah. fact that you've set up this group. You know, that's, you know, it's going to be so helpful for so many people. Yeah, I listened to a lot of podcasts early on because I wanted to identify, I wanted to hear how people, if it was possible to recover and that people could recover. So I, I, I understand the... I think it's amazing what you're doing with this podcast. It's, it's being part of the positive change that we need to see in the world because this doesn't have to be a thing. No. It never has to be a thing again. Mm. If we only have known what we know now. So that's why I want people to give, you know, because everybody's different and recovery is different for everybody. So to get as many people as possible as different experiences and then people can learn from those. And yeah and I think I almost have an obligation as someone who's walked through the fire so to speak and if I see someone else walking through the fire I almost feel like I have an obligation to go like hey let me help show you the way so you're yeah. not alone yeah because yeah. you that's what it feels like you feel alone yeah very very alone yeah so Alexandra well thank you so much for sharing your story it's thank you wonderful Kate. to talk to you <laughs> Yes. So that, that's all for today's episode of Bulimia Sucks. And thank you for listening. And thank you to Alexandra. And I just wanted to say how proud your grandmother would be of you. Thank you. She would be. Um, now, join us again for the next episode of Bulimia Sucks. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen, so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you haven't already heard about it, check out my book, Bulimia Sucks, and it's on Amazon. So thank you for listening, and thank you, um, Alexandra. And before we go, show some love for your favourite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. So make sure you join our Facebook group, so it's great to be able to hear other people's stories and and experiences and learn from them so thanks for listening and i'll look forward to the next episode